I don't know about you, but for us, this new Barbie film seems to have come out of nowhere. And now Margaret Robbie is Barbie. Margaret has been renowned as one of the best looking women in the Hollywood space for a while now. And even beauty culture in general does talk about her looks. What specific physiognomic features and cephalometric proportions make her a great pick for Barbie? That's a question that no one asked, but we're going to answer anyway. And furthermore, what people do care about is what makes her face so attractive. This video wouldn't be complete without a discussion about Margaret's jawline. This is isn't really the part of her face that particularly allows her to play Barbie, but it does contribute greatly to her look. Now, Margaret's jaw doesn't seem to fit all of the standards of a quote unquote beautiful feminine jaw, at least according to the various literatures on the topic. However, let's not kid ourselves that Margaret doesn't have an attractive jawline. It just does not lean heavily into the feminine ideals, being more on the masculine side. Research by Rekabi et al. actually asked surgeons, orthodontists, and lay people their perspective on the beautiful female jawline. So let's try to break down their findings and see if it applies to Margot. Keep in mind though that researchers ask different groups for a reason as the education of the observer can slightly alter their perceptions of beauty as well as sensitivity to changes in specific features and what you find most attractive may not exactly be the same as what the surgeon determines to be most attractive. Firstly, let's discuss Margot's jaw width which is called the intergonial width. The researchers photoshopped different jaw widths as a proportion of the cheekbone width or the interzygomatic width all the way from 116% to 72%. Basically, a range of jaw widths from super wide to narrow. We're not going to get too caught up on the specific number and we'll explain why in a bit. But before finding out what they consider ideal or most attractive, let's analyze Margaret's jaw width. Her jaw width is about 87% of her cheekbone width, which would fall right about here in the diagram. All of the raiders actually favored narrower jaws, where the surgeons and orthodontists preferred the narrowest jaw and the lay people preferred the second narrowest. That might look something like this on Margot. So test if you can indeed find it more attractive. And a well-renowned book by Dr. William Prophet called Contemporary Orthodontics also subjectively notes that the intergonial width or the jaw width should be the distance between the two horizontal lines dropped from the outer canthus. That does closely align with the proportion they found in this paper but the researchers do note a beautiful range of 72% to 86%, which is right near where Margot stands, so it's not that unusual either. Still though, the issue with this study is that while the results were significant, everyone has a different face. A narrower jaw might not harmonize well with Margot's broader and taller forehead, or her facial height, and so on. In this study, they just showed altered photos of one face and one feature. Moreover, facial beauty might be affected by the ethnicity of the person and the cultural ethnicity of the judges as well, as well as numerous other socioeconomic factors, demographic, educational determinants, and so on as well. This is why we don't get caught up with the specific number, but the takeaway is that narrow jaws do seem to trend on average be preferred in women, at least within reason and in line with the concept of normalcy or averageness. On top of this, Margot also has some masculinizing jaw characteristics with a more acute jaw angle and a longer ramus. We've made other videos that go into further detail on these, but the ramus is a highly dimorphic trait. Men typically have longer ramuses or rami, and this is so dimorphic that you can tell the sex of a deceased skull simply by the shape of the jaw rami. Overall, we can characterize her jaw as more masculine, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she has an unattractive jaw. Her jaw just doesn't lie at the extremes like, say, Olivia Wilde. Also, in the same paper, Margaret fits the same preferences for female jaw angles, positioned almost at the level of the mouth corner according to the judges. This view here is what is called the oblique three-quarter view, and the judges tried to determine what the most attractive position of the jaw gonian, or this point here, was. You can see, just like before, a bunch of different variations of jaw position, but image 2 here was found to be the most attractive where the jaw gonian was in line with the mouth. Margaret doesn't perfectly fit that standard, but she is within an attractive range. It also seems like the jaw ramus in that study was altered to be more vertical, which also gives the jaw a boxy look. Margaret doesn't seem to have that issue in the oblique view, so her jaw doesn't appear overly boxy. And this is the key characteristic. While the jaw may be more masculinized, it isn't masculine. Margaret also fits the conventional standards of a lean and well-defined jawline irrespective of her actual bone structure. In the west there is a high preference for faces with high facial robusticity, basically sharp angular features both for men and women. She has low levels of some mental fat which creates a defined angle from both the neck and the chin which is attractive according to Nani et al study. Nobody is looking at Margaret's jaw and saying it's ugly because it's a bit more on the masculine side. With all of that being said, how does this fit into her casting as Barbie? Well it's more or less all in the eyes. As early as 1954 
you for with researchers like Paul Secker, questions have been posed like what faces perceived to correspond with what personality type? Here at Cooves, we're not specialists on Barbies, but when you think of Barbie, you think of a gleeful, excitable, and friendly personality. Since Barbie is a live action film, the directors want to do the best job of carrying that over to the big screen. In a sense, casting directors must ask themselves that same question posed by Secker. This refers to an outdated concept called physiognomy, where we try to ascertain an individual's personality, characters, ethics, and so on just based solely on their appearance, specifically the facial appearance in this context. For the casting directors, they assumedly chose Margaret because her face reflects that Barbie persona. It isn't just about being blonde with blue eyes. I mean, if you look at all of these models, they wouldn't have too hard of a job as being a convincing Barbie either. The actual facial structure and layout of the features matter more than the coloring of the features themselves. This looks inference method of thinking can be dated back as far as 500 BC, where Pythagorean schools chose their students based on how they looked. Even Aristotle noted a high forehead means that an individual is sluggish or large ears means a person engages in a lot of silly chatter. And obviously none of this is true. But what is true is that we do make immediate judgments of a person's personality, whether it's correct or not, based on how they look straight away. And we know that this is quite a ridiculous assumption to make. However, with modern scientific processes, we can test if there is any truth behind this idea of physiognomy. And there does seem to be a little bit of truth to every lie. Just not in the way that Aristotle thought. It's not as if you can point to Margaret's high forehead and say she is quick-witted or a poor decision maker or lazy or any number of unrelated personality traits that the ancient Greeks might have thought. There is no research to support that and we're certainly not saying that at all. However, our facial morphology, the shape itself of our facial features does affect how others perceive us. Research by Rule in 2016 as well as older research on the topic in 1985 by Keating established a connection between facial shape and perceptions of dominance, for example. As various facial features like the jaws, eyebrows, eyes were altered to be more mature, the faces were perceived as more dominant. This may be surprising to you, or perhaps not, but increasing the dominance in male faces made them more attractive, while the opposite was true for women. For example, if we give Margaret more mature features, particularly in the eyes, because that is where the effect is strongest, we found for a singly manipulated facial feature that she does become less attractive. Again, the point of the video isn't to look at Barbie dolls. You don't even have to have ever touched a Barbie doll to know that they don't appear dominant or threatening. That's just not the look. They typically have larger eyes and more neonate features in general, and they just do look non-threatening. And the same can be said about Margaret's eyes. She has a traditionally feminine or dimorphic eye region that actually does make her a perfect fit for the casting of Barbie. One thing that is quite interesting is that when the researchers presented combinations of altered features, the results weren't as clear as manipulating a single feature that is something worth considering. And perhaps why Margaret largely benefits from the attractiveness of feminine and non-dominant eyes even while having a more masculine jaw structure. All of this makes sense if we think about it from a socio-biological perspective. Our initial impressions of others use physical attractiveness with stereotypic gender norms or social dominance. These arguments are supported by common observations of feminine beauty techniques, for example, such as makeup techniques for making the eyes rounder. At least when this paper was written, the typical prescription for beauty in Western culture included making the eyes look larger, brows thinner and arched, much like Margaret's natural eyes. Some of that may have changed with beauty standards such as the thicker eyebrows now, but the general concept does still apply today, especially if we look at Eastern beauty culture by comparison. Even in various non-human species like Harris sparrows, horn size in mountain sheep and greying in the mountain gorilla are morphological features meant to signal sexual maturity and dominance. In this sense, Margaret has larger palpable height and palpable width, which simply means that she has larger eyes, which is again femininely sexually dimorphic. Her eyes are also quite wide and upturned, which researchers call palpable axis among other terms. Along with wide set eyes, this is an attractive trait in women, according to Quan et al, where Barbie dolls tend to exaggerate this feature to a great degree. No human really has eyes that are that upturned, so Margaret is as close as a face could get without looking cartoonish. As for her eyebrows, they are not brooding but rather moderately positioned above her eyes, do not appear overly dominant or docile. Additionally, her distinct brow arch is a traditionally feminine feature that you obviously won't commonly find in men. A lot of that has to do with the morphology of the brow bone itself, and it's clear that Margaret has a feminine brow ridge. With all of that said, none of her features are overly exaggerated to appear cartoonish or non-average like an actual Barbie. Margaret essentially looks like how a Barbie would look as a real person, close to it, and the answer is as simple as that. The reason why she is so attractive is because she displays physiognomic signs of non-dominance in the eyes, which we link to attractiveness in women, while remaining proportionate and harmonious, symmetrical, dimorphic, 
and all the other characteristics that make a face attractive in general. The other facial features like the lips, nose, skin, and jaw are also high in what's known as coinophilia or averageness, meaning that they are representative of the average white woman's face. Margaret fits the attractive mold of a face with high averageness and one or two non-average or exceptional facial features, which we've covered in our previous podcast episodes is the key to making an attractive and memorable face where you have a baseline of attractive features or attractive prerequisites and a couple of unique features that are especially dimorphic that separates the face apart that makes people truly memorable. In her case, it's her jaw and eyes that both give her a unique look so she doesn't look like any other blonde with blue eyes. We couldn't get into every feature of hers in this video, but hopefully that lends some credence into why casting directors would choose a face like Margot's. No, they aren't analyzing her face like we just broke it down here, but usually they do have a feel for what face gives off what vibe. It seems that they made the right decision with Margot for Barbie, but we'll be able to tell for sure when we actually see her in the role. Just a quick note on Ken, we did make a analysis of Ryan Gosling's face, which is very well casted for somebody like Ken, who is more of a himbo, and I don't know what the word would be, a, a male dit. And for those reasons, Ken is, is more of an appropriate role. If you don't believe that to be true, just think of some hyper-masculine man playing Ken, such as, I don't know, Jason Momoa. It wouldn't just really be the same, would it? Margaret has a few Hollywood lookalikes, if you've ever seen Samara Weaving or Jamie Presley, but these subtle facial features arguably make Margot more conventionally attractive and a better fit for Barbie. So what do you think? Was Margot the best pick for Barbie, or do you think someone else would have made a better casting choice? So with that being said, if you like the way that we broke down the face here, and if you'd like to analyze your face in, with much more candor and perspective, you'd like to change the way that you look, get a second opinion, have our team of doctors and dentists take a look over at the Coos website, and you can commission yourself a aesthetics report if you're interested in having a breakdown of your facial features. As always, I'll catch you all in the next one.